What's up you guys? It's Prabhdeep here with Channel Ace Pants. Today I'm going to talk about diabetic retinopathy. I will use the pathophysiology to better help you understand the fundoscopic findings of the pathology. So without further ado, let's get started. Diabetic retinopathy is the most common complication of diabetes mellitus and is the leading cause of blindness in ages 20 and 64 in the United States. It affects about 3.4% of the population, which comes out to be 4.1 million individuals, and about one-fourth of them have vision-threatening disease. To put into perspective how destructive this complication is, let's look at this stat from Harrison's textbook. Diabetic patients are 25 times more likely to, bl uh, to develop blindness than someone without diabetes. Now, if that doesn't send chills down your spine, then I don't know what will. The risk of developing retinopathy is directly correlated with duration of the diabetes and the level of glycemic control. About 80% of type 2 and about almost all of type 1 have some degree of retinopathy after having 20 years of diabetes. Additionally, comorbidities like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and other microvascular complications of diabetes like nephropathy, and neuropathy can increase your chances of developing retinopathy. Pregnancy is also another risk factor for developing and worsening diabetic retinopathy, but keep in mind that diagnosis of diabetes has to be established prior to the pregnancy. Gestational diabetes does not cause diabetic retinopathy. Again, gestational diabetes does not cause diabetic retinopathy. Now, these statistics might sound scary, but tight glycemic control can decrease your chances of developing diabetic retinopathy. However, this only applies in early stages. Once in later stage, glucose control has very limited effect. That is why it's very important to screen patients early on and prevent the development and progression of diabetic retinopathy. Patient education is the key here, guys. I'm not conveying that scarier patients, but it's important for them to know what the complications are going to be, okay? What to expect and what the statistics are behind it. So they can be motivated to be compliant with the diet, the medications, and follow-ups. Because as we'll learn later on in the video, this is asymptomatic in early, uh, in early stages or even during later stages, it's asymptomatic. They're not gonna know what's happening inside the body until it's too late. So it's our job as clinicians to make sure we educate them as to what's going on even though they're asymptomatic so we can prevent it from them developing blindness uh, down the line, okay? Before we move on to learning about the pathophysiology, symptomatology, diagnostic and the management approach of diabetic retinopathy, I would briefly like to go over the basic anatomy of the eye that we will need later on for our discussion. The basic structures that we need to know are the following, retina, macula, the optic nerve, the retinal arteries and vein, the vitreous body, the lens, ciliary body, iris, pupil, and the cornea. The space between the lens and the retina is taken up by the vitreous humor and anteriorly is taken by the aqueous humor. Okay, the aqueous humor is produced in the ciliary body and it travels anteriorly and it gets drained at the angle right here. This angle is important to know because it will come up later in the video as one of the complications uh, of diabetic retinopathy. Now let's focus on the posterior aspect of the eye involving the retina, macula, and fovea. Retina is light sensitive tissue which is highly vascularized it is the extension of the central nervous system and plays an important role in our vision. Near the center of the retina, there is a yellow oval region called the macula. Macula is responsible for the sharp and clear central vision. Within the macula, there is a small depression called the fovea where visual acuity is the highest. Macula and fovea are both responsible for the central vision, whereas retina is responsible for the peripheral. Therefore, the macular pathologies will cause central vision loss, while retinal pathologies will cause peripheral. This was a basic overview of the anatomy of the eye. Moving on to the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy. It can be divided into two stages, non-proliferative and proliferative. On the severity scale, non-proliferative falls under the mild to moderate category, while proliferative can be seen on the other side of the spectrum, it being severe in nature. What I mean by this is that proliferated retinopathy has a higher chance of causing blindness and it requires invasive intervention to stop the progression and prevent its complications. That's why I put it on the severe side of the spectrum. Whereas non-proliferative, there is a chance of reversing it with dietary changes and strict glycemic control, and therefore it's mild to moderate. In terms of the progression of diabetic retinopathy, patients usually develop 
non-proliferative changes first and then eventually progress to proliferative if left untreated. However, keep in mind that proliferative retinopathy can occur without any underlying non-proliferative retinopathy. The key difference between both of these is that proliferative stage has neovascularization. That is why it's called proliferative since it gives rise to new vessels. Non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is characterized by four fundoscopic findings, microaneurysms, intraretinal hemorrhages, nerve fiber infarcts, and heart exudates. One of the main components responsible for this pathology is the parasite. Parasites can be found on the vasculature, as you can see in the picture. It has multiple functions, but the one we're concerned about here is its ability to provide structural support for the capillaries. In diabetes, chronic hypoglycemia causes apoptosis of these parasites, resulting in the formation of microaneurysms. This occurs because the walls become weak without the parasites and they start to form these outpouches, which we refer to as aneurysms. And since these occur at the level of capillaries, we call them microaneurysms. These outpouches are made of weak walls and are very prone to rupture. Once they do rupture, they give rise to intraretinal hemorrhages, and we see them as the classic dot and blot hemorrhages on our fundoscopic exam. In summary, dysfunction and destruction of the parasites uh, result to the first two components of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which are the microaneurysms resulting in intraretinal hemorrhages. The second component that contributes to this pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy is through the dysfunction of the blood retinal barrier. This barrier is formed by endothelial cells and the basement membrane. They control the transportation of nutrients and waste product across the blood vessel to the retina and from the retina to the blood vessel. In diabetes, hyperglycemia damages the endothelial lining and the basement membrane, compromising this barrier. This causes an increased spillage of fluid through the barrier, resulting in macular and retinal edema. However, body is able to compensate in early stages by removing the excess fluid in a timely manner. But it does leave fatty sediments behind, which appear as waxy yellow deposits on your fundus fundoscopic exam. These lesions are called hard exudates. Also, it has been noticed in experimenting of diabetic rats that low-grade inflammation plays a key role in early stages of retinopathy. It causes leukostasis, which causes occlusion and then ischemia. It is believed that this inflammation is secondary to the damaged parasites and endothelial uh, cells. Additionally, the damaged parasites cause vasoconstriction, which further contributes to the occlusion and causing decreased perfusion. Because of this, the nerve endings tend to infarct and they appear as fluffy white patches called cotton wool spots. Retina is a highly vascular membrane, and during this period of decreased perfusion, it releases a molecule called VEGF to counter the hyperperfusion. VEGF is the key factor in progression of non-proliferative to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. VEGF promotes formation of new vessels and increases permeability. Overall, it sounds like a good thing, right? It appears the body is trying to compensate by increasing blood flow and nutrient exchange. But in reality, it's making the already existing problem much worse. The newly formed vessels are faulty, they're very friable and leaky, so they tend to bleed more and worsen the retinal and macular edema by having a weak blood retinal barrier. Not only that, these vessels tend to grow in places where they're not supposed to. For example, they might grow into the vitreous body. This can be problematic because over time with age, the vitreous tends to shrink and it can pull off the vessel from the retina causing it to tear and resulting in vitreous hemorrhage. In another instant, it might actually become a strong anchor between the retina and the vitreous body and detach the retina instead, which can, re which can result in vision loss, and if not reattached in a timely manner, especially if a macula is involved, then the vision loss may be permanent. Not only that, the angiogenic event can occur anteriorly in the eye. The vessel can form at the angle of the anterior chamber where the aqueous fluid drains out, as we had discussed earlier in the video during the anatomy section. This obstruction of the aqueous fluid draining out increases intraocular pressure and causes acute glaucoma. Now, just when you think things can't get worse, well, they can, in certain cases at least. 
The events that we mentioned above that can cause sudden loss of vision or cause acute glaucoma are not even the common causes of vision loss in diabetic retinopathy. The most common cause of vision loss in this pathology is through macular edema. Now, it can happen in non-proliferative retinopathy, but it's more common in proliferative thanks to the newly formed leaky vessels. The more of these vessels that are created, the worse the problem is going to get. Okay, In simple terms, the more new vascularization that occurs, the faster you're going to develop blindness. Now, in terms of symptomatology, patients are usually asymptomatic until they're in later stages. And that's what makes this disease so hard to detect early on. Many patients will not take it seriously because there are no alarming symptoms until it has gotten to the point where it's hard to reverse. That's why proper screening and patient education are very essential. Screening should start immediately for type 2, and for type 1, you can wait anywhere from 3 to 5 years. And in childbearing women, uh, it should be made known that pregnancy causes rapid deterioration of diabetic retinopathy and will need frequent dilated eye exams throughout their pregnancy. The first one will be prior to conception for a baseline, and then there'll be uh, one during trimester, and then, well, I'm sorry, one during first trimester, and then one every three months. And they will continue to be closely observed postpartum for about a year. This only applies to patients with already existing diabetes, okay? If you have gestational diabetes, this does not put you at risk for developing diabetic retinopathy, okay? And you do not require frequent eye examination. Now, in terms of the diagnostic approach, patients are going to need a dilated exam by the ophthalmologist to fully visualize the changes that we spoke about in pathophysiology. For non-proliferative, you're going to see microaneurysms, cotton wool spots, hard exudates, and intraretinal hemorrhages. For proliferative, it's going to be a lot of similar changes, but the main one is neovascularization, formation of new vessels. Now, there are a lot of diagnostic modalities that the ophthalmologists uh, will have at their discretion, but you're not responsible for knowing them. Your job is to give the proper follow-up and then they will take care of it. Same thing goes for management. Uh, for like proliferative, they have agents like VEGF, anti-VEGF agents, um, pet pan retinal photocoagulation. They have a lot of interventions that they can do, but you're not responsible for knowing them, okay? Your job is to manage diabetes and underlying risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, and systemic fluid overload conditions like nephropathy, okay? And your job is to tell patients to have a proper diet uh, and exercise regularly. Now, this applies to non-proliferative. When you go to proliferative, you can do all of that, but do not recommend exercising. The reason for that is when you exercise, you increase the pressure in your arteries, right? And because of that, they're more prone to rupture. And with these neovascularization, where you, you know, you're popping these new vessels with weak vessels and, you know, and you put them under high stress, they're more prone to rupture, causing vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, retinal hemorrhage, and whatnot, okay? So for that reason, you do not recommend exercising in non, I'm sorry, in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Let them go to the ophthalmologist, let them get treated and managed by them. And if they think it's, it seems fit for them to exercise, then that's their decision to make, not yours. When a patient comes to you and, you know, the ophthalmologist has diagnosed the patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you do not tell them to exercise, okay? Leave that decision to the ophthalmologist. All right, All right guys. That was an overview of diabetic retinopathy. I hope you guys liked it. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, I really tried using the pathophysiology to better understand, you know, the fundoscopic findings of both the non-proliferate and proliferated diabetic retinopathy. And again, I hope it helped you guys. Uh, and if it did, please like, subscribe, um, and hit the bell button for future videos. Share it with your friends, colleagues, and your classmates. I would really appreciate it. And it will really help me with the YouTube algorithm, okay? Stay safe. Stay tuned and I'll be back soon. Take care.